I just heard an incredible stat, which is every minute, 200 businesses hit their millionth dollar in revenue using Stripe, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we talk about impact. I mean, that's a fun fact to start. I want to start, Claire, with, I think, a really formative question, which is when you think back to when you're a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I mean, the honest answer for a long time is I really wanted to be a veterinarian, like an animal doctor. Okay. And, you know, animals, founders, very Nurturing. similar. <laughs> wild, <laughs> wild domestication processes. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, I would love to start, you know, we see the Claire Hughes Johnson stay. You've written the incredible book. I want to start on management style and philosophy. When you think about what it is today, how has that changed over time most significantly? Um, putting my veterinary career aside, yeah, brief. I, I would tell you an interesting thing, which is when I was in college, and I don't know what inspired me to do this. My parents are teachers. I grew up in an environment that was about learning, not about business, not about capitalism. But somehow in college, I acquired a Godfather 3 poster of Al Pacino sitting in a chair, and it said, real power cannot be given, it must be taken. And I think I had a really, like, I am going to undermine the superstructure from within by acquiring some sort of power thing that, you know, I was very interested in politics at the time. I was sort of like interested in power structures. And, and honestly, I think I was interested in how do you change power structures. I'd like to believe that. But what happened when I became a manager was you realize all of a sudden you can't be the one taking the power. You actually have to be giving it to your team. And one of the harshest pieces of feedback I ever got was one of my first sort of consulting bosses who I presented uh, the work of my team in front of them to him. And I was like, well, I'm the leader. I'm going to present the work and he's going to give us feedback. And after the meeting, he took me aside and he said, he's like, what do you think? And he named each person. He asked me, what do you think they were thinking? And I was like, what, what were they thinking? I'm like, what do you think of the work? And he said, yeah, you really didn't give credit to Trisha. You left Dom out. He should have presented the technical section. And it was a, like a huge lesson that I had been thinking, I'm the leader. I should talk. I should present. And instead, I should have been empowering the people in the room um, with the opportunity, right, to show their work and to get credit and recognition. And so you sort of think you're taking power, but actually you should be giving power. And then the final twist was you get too enabling of your team. You're too kind to them. You don't tell them directly you're not doing well, you empower them, and then you say, wait a minute, this isn't what I expected. So it's like this sort of journey you go on and like how you handle that dynamic of expectation and feedback yeah. of yourself and also of your team. This is why I stopped writing schedules because I just didn't stick to them. So if we take the like <laughs> taking power first, to get to the management position, do you have to take power though? How do you think about that ascension and what's crucial to go from IC to manager yeah. I actually think the best managers are usually ones you're tapping on the shoulder. They're not people clamoring to be a manager because the people clamoring to be a manager think it's some route to power and leadership when in fact, like I think the, and this is also the trap of management, like the most effective individual contributor is the person you tap on the shoulder and say, will you be the manager? But then of course, it's a totally different job yeah. and they have to completely relearn how they do their work and, and trust other people to do the work. But that's the best. I don't think you want someone who's clamoring because they usually have the wrong reasons. Do many ICs make good managers? Because they are totally different jobs. And what would you advise founders who have ICs who are maybe going to yeah. be managers? Yeah. In scaling people, I talk about, I mean, I'm simplifying here, but one of my operating principles is distinguish between management and leadership. And if I'm going to be very simplistic, I would say a lot of founders are very natural leaders, setting vision, very high bar, you know, almost unrealistic expectations. And a lot of operators like me are more natural managers. How do I get from point A to B, organize the process, the project, the people? And I think ICs can sort of fall in those two categories. There's these pace setting leader like, like, wow, that person is ambitious and driven. And then there's people who are organizers and really can sort of execute well. And, and I think over time, both could become managers, but depending on which camp they're starting in, and I do think people have a natural camp, they're gonna have some things to learn or they're gonna hit a ceiling in their career. Can I ask, when you think about kind of delegating those responsibilities that you said there where you kind of said, hey, here's what we've done, but it was you presenting, how do you think about importance of speed of execution? And does that change over time as well? 
Because we're told speed, speed, speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Velocity, velocity, velocity. Yeah. Um, a lot of people think that my book is about people and organizations like I'm obsessed with. And I, I really do care. Like, you know, what are companies made up of? They're made up of people. Uh, but really, actually, the book is about if you build the right systems and processes, it, out, it affects the results. It's about business results. And so I think my answer to that is so many companies, as they scale, feel so acutely the coordination like the compound effect of coordination cost, which is really high. Things do slow down. Yeah. But I actually think one of the counters to that seems counterintuitive, which is put in some structure, put in some processes. Well, well how does Stripe do that? Because your product cadence is like unparalleled given the size of company. And I, I don't know anyone... I mean, oh, I, I think if you ask people internally, they would say they we're very unsatisfied. But I mean, compared to Bunny, the you know, incumbent set, it's pretty incredible in terms of speed. So how do you have such agility with size? Again, I think there's like anyone that you're trying to organize, whether it's three people or 20 people, needs a common vocabulary. What, and also a common understanding. Why do we exist? What are we trying to accomplish either right now, this month, or in five years? And how do we want to do that work together, the operating principles? And I think at Stripe, we spend a ton of time First of all, everyone's very motivated by the why, you know, increasing the GDP of the internet huh. is, you know, it's a, it's a very ambitious mission, right? And, and, and then they're also understanding the what very specifically, because when you deal in sort of economic infrastructure payments, very unique to different countries, very detailed and rigorous work you have to do to understand what moves the needle. And so we spend a ton of time in the details of the what, and then we lay out sort of expectations, but we don't define how you're going to get there sometimes. And it's very interesting to watch. I think the teams feel acutely this list of things to get done. And then they're like, oh my gosh. And we somehow have to accomplish it in this time. And we don't get it all done. Can I ask, can we take a step back? Because I think you know, you've created and assembled some of the best teams. Uh, how do you think about talent acquisition and some of your core cool lessons in terms of what it takes to acquire the best talent? Do you have a process? Do you have questions that you like to ask? What are the signals that they reveal? Yeah, I, I think too much of the discussion often about hiring is that it's an art. Like some people have a talent radar and yeah. some people don't. And I would just disagree. There is a judgment. There is a je ne sais quoi. You can't sort of put your finger on the feel, right? But actually 90% of it is more science. And the challenge that I find, and I work with so many people who are like, well, I interviewed this person. I said, well, what happened in the interview? And they're like, well, I just looked at their CV and we had a great chat about their, their past experiences. I was like, well, then they kind of interviewed you <laughs> because they know more about their past experiences and they can just control that conversation. You need to go in with a plan. What is the job I'm hiring for? What are the capabilities for success in that role? What are the questions I'm gonna ask? What do good answers look like? And you need to ask the same things of all those candidates for that role so you can build a data set and compare, like that's the scientific part of it. Because people that you might relate to well in the interview may not actually have the best answers. And if you know what the best answers are, that's what you're looking for. How many people should you interview to get a large enough data set to say, okay, I've done my work and I know a reasonable benchmark? So, so I have two answers to that. So one is interviewing over time. I'm, I've interviewed thousands of people. So I think I have a very large data set across many different positions, yeah. many levels, many positions. And there are some commonalities that you start to see in the data, no matter if you're you know, going to be an IC support rep or you know, the head of revenue. Like I can tell you there are certain ways people answer questions that are more at the abstracted level of, are they self-aware? Are they someone who learns? Do they strive for impact? Right? Those are things I'm looking for. I don't care what level you are. Uh, but then in terms of a specific position, I think that's hard. It depends on how much interviewing experience you've had. Would you ever Let's hire say the, 10. Would you ever hire the first person if they're great? You're like, fantastic. Love them. Great chemistry. Probably not. Probably not. How fast is Unless it? Unless they like blow me out of the water and I think, you know what? I'd hire them for anything. Which okay. ideally is every candidate, but let's be realistic. There's, there's two kind of points which I think reveal quite a lot in the hiring process, which is title and salary. What are lessons in terms of how people respond to title and salary and maybe how it corresponds to potential ability or future success? 
Yeah, I mean, Stripe, we really stayed away. Maybe we've done it for too long from title uh, because I do think it's a false flag and it also backs you into a corner as you're scaling. So you've suddenly given titles away and then you're like, well, now I have to restructure and bring in more experience. So I'm not a fan of title and people seeking title, like especially if you're early. You want them motivated by what you're building and what they see and the people that work there. And I think the title, like, I'm just going to take a job only if you give me a VP title. That's a, that's a kind of an orange flag to me. Um, and, and compensation, like, again, depending on what stage company you are, if that's someone's motivator, why aren't they going to work for a big tech company that has that? That's their currency, is I can pay you more. But I, I will say in my book, I have this uh, talent framework that I developed, which is some people are pushers and some people are pullers. There's a certain talent type I've found, the pushers, who are just keeping score. They're very competitive, they're very driven, and they're constantly bringing up their title and compensation. And I used to really bother me, to be honest, it would really annoy me, and I get it now. I'm like, look, you're just keeping score, but you know what, you can't bring it up every meeting. So I'll just say, here's the rules, we'll talk about it once every six months, that's your shot. And then otherwise, let's talk about actually what you're pushing, the actual work, not the results of the work. Can I ask, how obvious is a bad hire in the process? Is it obvious a month in, three months in, six months in? Do you know that? Oh, there's a huge continuum of that. Um, I think there, there have been some hires I've seen and that in the end of the hiring process, they start to reveal themselves. And I cannot say strongly enough, like somehow they realize they've got the job and their behavior changes. And you're like, what? Or the first week on the job, they're really terrible in their team spin up, like they're not listening. No, I'm serious. Or they're acting like a knower. They're like, well, I already know all this. I don't need to be in the training. And I would say, just say, thank you so much. We made a mistake. Like I would really walk, but that is rare. It's rare, but it happens. I think it's more in about, it, depending on the role, a, a earlier stage role, you probably know in about a month to two months. I think in a more complicated role, someone with experience, it's probably three max six months. Yeah. yeah, I remember Max Levchin from a firm said on our show once, um, when there's doubt, there's no doubt. Do you think that's right? I mean, I think... Have people surprised you? That's generous. People have surprised me, but I would say it's fairly rare. Yeah. I mean, I hate to be the person, if people follow thinking around growth mindset, uh, you don't... I'm not the person who would say, the way you are is the way you are, and you can't grow. Because that's, that's, that's not... savage. It would be terrible. It's savage. It's not true. But I think what Max is talking about is something I see. Now I sit on a lot of boards, and you listen to the CEO talk about their executive team. And when they have a doubt about someone who's in a leadership role, and they're sort of saying, well, but, you know, they, they came into a difficult... They start making excuses for them. It came into a difficult situation, the macro environment's been difficult, and they're sort of trying to explain to themselves why is it that I'm not confident in this person? Yeah. I've now come to believe that kind of doubt, there's no doubt. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. Okay, so before kind of making a decision, we do need to give feedback. Yes. Feedback is tough to give sometimes. Um, I'm often told that you need to give a shit sandwich, um, which is nice, shit, nice. Um, and that's like the secret. We chatted last night and you were like, maybe not. Yeah. Is a shit sandwich wrong? I that should be the title of I the think it's sh- <laughs> uh, I think it's, it is wrong. Um, I would say that um, in, as the manager of a person, I don't care if you've just started working together or you've been working together for two years, your job is to have built a relationship that exists at multiple levels. Um, so one of the levels is you have very clear expectations. They know their expectations of them, not in a detailed list, but they understand the role, what you expect. You've set goals together. They have priorities. Uh, another level is you understand their development goals. You can have a career conversation within the first few months. What are you looking to do? What do you, how do you want to grow? And then there's a level of like, look, we've got to have a dialogue about how our things are going and it's got to be open and easy. And it's like easy for me to say all those things, by the way. So few managers forget, like you've got to set the expectations. You've got to understand them and what motivates them. You've got to manage different people differently. And then you get to the work of giving feedback. So let's say you've actually laid some of that foundation. Yep. 
starting even in your first meeting with someone. How do, you, how do we want to run our one-on-ones together? Why don't you come to me with a draft of your goals for this month? Whatever it is. So is it the same for every person, or do you tailor it for different people? I have, like, a lot of my operating system, uh, which is another operating principle of mine, is, like, come back to your operating system, is I have a framework. I stru- Like, literally, this is how my one-on-one document is structured. This is how I onboard someone into working with me, and, and then what I ask of them, and then I adapt to them, because they're going to have differences that I adapt to. But I think you want a common OS, essentially. But I say all this because you can't walk in. The problem is managers walk into the first time they're giving someone feedback and they're like, Harry, you're doing so well at presenting at the team meeting, but you didn't like get five of the last things I asked you to get done on time. And anyway, thanks so much for being a great presenter. You're going to be like, wait, what? What just happened? You know, you got I thought it. that was a great meeting. Yeah, yeah you liked that because you're like, well, what I'm going to take away is that I'm such a great presenter at the team meeting. And I wanted you to take away so you're not you a, being accountable for your work deadline. So you'd walk in and say, I'd hey, wa- last five things. I'd walk minutes. in and say, I want to check in on your goals right now because I have them at the top of my dock with you. And you're saying, oh, this is okay. I think I'm doing well. And then I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, you know what I'm worried about? I'm worried about the fact that all of these seem like they're delayed. What do you, th- you think is happening? So I'm not going to start with, you are not meeting your deadlines. I'm judging you. I'm going to start with, them. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to say, what is going on? Because it feels like every single goal, everything we had on the list is delayed. Are they good? And I'm going to give you a chance to tell me. And there are good reasons. Sometimes. Hey, I'm so sorry. You know, macro, uh, people yep. are buying slower. I lost our champion. Yeah, but you know what that is? What? That's being a victim. No, I'm not going to say that to you, but I'll tell you, like, it's very interesting when you give people feedback, they're either going to be a victim and blame the, every external, their other team member, the macro environment, the customer, or they're going to be really, the people I want to hire, they're going to be really self-aware and they're going to say, well, yes, of course, there's been challenges in the environment, but what I should have done is follow up on that deal faster. You say, okay, so that was number one. You didn't follow up on the deal fast enough. You had other deals in the work. You know, maybe they're a salesperson, a BD person. You say, well, tell me what else. And you dig. And, and one of the things that uh, I think is a great framework, it's not mine, is the five whys, which is like, well, okay, so why didn't you follow up on the deal? And like, you're trying to get at an underlying thing that's going on with the person. And by the way, in this journey, what you're t- doing is moving from being in opposition to one another to try to sit next to each other and say, let's just look at this problem together. Like, what do you think is going on here? And maybe there's like three of the five, there's actually a common pattern, which just has to do with the person is like terrible at time management. And they're probably getting a lot of inbound and they're just like, well, I'm doing the thing that feels urgent, but it's actually not that important. And so you're diagnosing with them and you're saying, what are you going to do differently? This would be our first conversation. It's actually, but I think it's pretty friendly. And they're thinking, wow, my manager cares about me. They're trying to help me diagnose. Why am I not meeting expectations? Do you find some people are more affronting to that conversation? I've had Hmm. it before where suddenly it's like, oh, oh, there's conflict here. Absolutely. There's people who get immediately defensive. Yeah. Yeah, and what even do you if do you then said, to simmer? Just like- I actually usually stop the conversation. I, I'll say, I'll, so here's the other thing is, you are animals, back to veterinary sciences. Notice how they're reacting. Notice what's happening in the room. Notice the energy and the body language of the person you're talking to. And then, this is the risky thing, and then talk about it. So I would stop and I would say, I am noticing that it feels like you, this is new information to you, that you're reacting, you, you need to process some of what I just said. Like, you haven't really actually thought about why you're not meeting these deadlines. And they're like, yeah, I mean, I don't think this is true. You say, well, I think we're seeing things differently. So I'm not going to back off. I'm not going to say I have no feedback for you. I'm going to say, I think we're seeing things differently, but I really respect that you need a minute. Like, should we, why don't we come back tomorrow? Like, why don't you take a minute, think about this. I've asked you some questions. Does and it get better tomorrow? I mean, do they... It depends. It really depends. Some people actually That's look, a hard thing to come back. If you back. think about sort of introverts versus extroverts, really in that framework, introverts really need to think in order to talk, and extroverts often talk to think. Uh, Harry, I think you're pretty extroverted. <laughs> but for, for some folks, they come back the next day and they've written up quite a bit. They've had to really think, and they wanted to write their thoughts, and they come back, and they, sometimes what they come back with is quite defensive, 
But I've, now we've got a chance to read a document together and say, okay, so this is what you think so is you going on. So you do ask them to come out with a doc? Not everybody, but some people I say, it seems like you want to respond to this. Why don't you write it up and share it with me so we can both process it and then have the conversation. But what I'm doing when I notice the reaction is, one, I'm telling them they're reacting because they don't know they are often, and I'm giving them an escape hatch, right? Because it's uncomfortable. If they say, no, 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 I, I want to carry on now, is that okay? Yes, if they say that, I say, okay. But what I feel like is we're not actually having a conversation. You're just telling me that you don't agree. And I'm telling you, by the way, feedback is just a mirror. I'm just holding up a mirror and I'm saying, look, I don't know what's actually going on with you, but here's what I'm seeing. Like in my mirror of you, I'm seeing a deadline problem. You do not meet your commitments. And, and, and I said, and you're disagreeing with me. And I said, well, let's talk, look, look at the data about that. Here's the data I have. What data do you have? But I'm not judging you. I think a lot of people are afraid to give feedback because they think that you're showing up at the one-on-one -on -one and I'm saying, you know what, Harry, you're a bad person because you don't meet your deadlines. I'm not. I, I don't think you're a bad person. I really like you. I want to support you. I'm your manager. But my job is to make sure that you know that I know that you're not meeting your deadlines. And if you don't notice it, we're going to get you to notice it and you're going to change your behavior. And how, if you don't change your behavior, you're long, not going to be on the team. How long do you give them? Really depends. I mean, I think that's the whole thing. So much of this, that's why it's hard to write a management That's not kind of early it's stage. It's context. If they're an early stage employee, 30 days max. Okay, okay I mean, so you have 30 days max. Sadly, I'm coming back with some bad docs, not giving good yeah. reasons, and you're yeah. like, got to let them go. Yep. You do. How do you do it the right way? Well, again, if you've done this correctly, we've had a few conversations, yeah. and you've come back, and I've said, here's, and you, you know, if you're in a more established company, you might have a performance improvement plan. But even if you don't, you just send them an email and say, here's the summary. It's what we talked about. You're going to do these things. You're going to meet your deadlines for the next two weeks. You've got this one project. I want to see the results. And I see them. And as the month is going on, we have our weekly one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm saying, you know what? I, I'm noticing you're not on track. I just want to call that out. Uh, and what's going to happen is they're either going to be like, you know what, I'm done. Like, I, I can't do this. Are and you conflict avoidant? Am I? Yeah. No, I think that the more that you can empower the person to, to be part of, like, notice their own issue and own it, that's not conflict avoidant. That's actually how you, I mean, really, it's a negotiation. It's like, here's what I see. What do you see? What do we both want? Now, most people, you can manage out by saying, I'm not seeing a good stuff. And if you want to own your departure, you might make a choice now to leave. But if you want to wait till the end of the month, I'm gonna, I, I, I will say I'm worried. I love the words, I'm worried. I'll say, I'm worried you're not going to meet this expectation of this plan we put together this month. And I want you to understand that that means you, you're not going to be on the team. And they're going to say, and I sometimes even say, do you think this is even the right job for you? Like, are you successful in a role like this? And some people will introspect, and then you're having a conversation about what do they really want to do? And then you have a decision to make, which is should they stay at the company? Is there another role that's good for them? Or is this really, this is the end? And I think too many people sort of let the problem roll to another team. So most of the time, I think it's the end. Okay, so we're going to do a quick fire round. We've got two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Uh, okay, so let's start with dinner with anyone, dead or alive. You can ask them any question. Who do you have dinner with? Virginia what do you Woolf. Ask? Who? Virginia Woolf. Okay. And what One do you of ask? the greatest writers in multiple centuries. What would you ask? I would ask her how she took the inner workings of humanity and the brain and put them on a page. Who's the best board member you sit on a board with? You know, I have really enjoyed uh, being on a board with Dara Khosrowshahi, who's the Uber CEO. Um, he's incredibly nice mix of empathetic, but very high bar, results driven, and strategic yet operational. Like he can get right in the detail and then he goes right back up to big picture. What's your biggest lessons from working with Patrick and John? They are so deeply curious. Like there is never enough information or feedback from is them. Is focus a challenge with yes. such curiosity? Yeah, but that's, I mean, look, every, every one of your greatest strengths is also your greatest weakness. What's the hardest challenge for you in terms of your role with Stripe? Um, the, the role of the COO when I was the COO is whatever the company needs it to be at that moment. Huh. 
So you have to be very, very good at getting out of your day-to-day and looking and saying, what does the company need me to be? And it's not just the company of today, it's the company of a year or two years from now. What's the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you? I know it's a weird one. I got asked it the other day, but I was like, it's a good one. It made me reflect back. The people who gave me a chance when I was... Yeah. Oh, so many people. I mean, I remember Sheryl Sandberg when I was um, coming back from my first maternity leave. She had just come back from hers. And she said, let's have lunch. And I was like, oh, scary. Sheryl Sandberg wants to have lunch. And she had lunch. She just wanted to check in. How are you doing? You know what? I know it's hard. It's very hard when you first come back from having a child because you're just very tired. <laughs> uh, and she's like, I know it's hard, but you know what? You can do it. And you're going to be fine. And I thought that was very kind. The other thing is, if you're someone who gives a lot of your time, your energy, there are certain people in my life who, like, make sure I've had dinner. <laughs> and I really appreciate people who, who make sure that I take care of myself. That's a final one. I think many in the audience are parents and have children, but also want to be the best operators, yes. the best founders. Yeah. What advice would you have to them in terms of being the best at both? Well... It's hard to be the best at both. So what you need to define is what your best is, right? I think there's a lot of judgment in the world. What does a great operator look like? What does a great parent look like? Forget that. What is your version of success? So define it and then lay out your priorities and put some boundaries. And um, someone yesterday at a dinner we saw last night uh, told me that she read something that happened to me, which maybe is a good thing to end on, but which is um, my daughter attended a speech I gave where I got asked a question about work-life balance. And I said to the questioner, I said, look, one, you know, you get the right partner in your life, and that makes a big difference. And the other is you decide what's important to be there for, for your kids. Maybe that's dinner three times a week. Maybe that's whenever they perform or they have a soccer match or whatever it is, you decide. I said, and then you show up for the important things. Uh, and I said, and that's what I tried to do. And my daughter, age 11, wrote me a note six months later for my birthday and said, by the way, I liked your talk. You were funny. And you do show up for the important things. Wow. I mean, that's, uh, that's a great ending point. That was feedback. And that it was has, a gift. That is great <laughs> feedback. Listen, Claire, thank you so much for this. Uh, I've loved doing it. I'm so glad we didn't have a schedule, but this has been fantastic fun. <laughs> thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. I'm awesome. taking my water.